<laughs> um, earlier this week, back on Wednesday, you remember that? It was like a long time ago. Uh, the very first panel that we had, I spoke about uh, do people want peace? And it was about the people priority and what do they really want. And I also talked about the Ludlow Amendment. Um, now, I will just throw this out there as devil's advocate and say that I don't personally think that's such a good idea because sometimes uh, when the people vote, uh, they get it wrong. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there was widespread, uh, I think, support for going into Afghanistan by the people. But we know that was wrong. We know it was illegal. We know it should ever should happen. So I think you have to be careful sometimes about letting people vote on, on things. Should, should we discuss that, or what's your form? Well, I, 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 I have people, a rebuttal to that. Okay. Yeah. Would, do you want to hear him rebut that, or do you want to yeah. ask? Okay. Yeah. So, so just the rebuttal here. Um, I think two things. Uh, the reality is that... Um, there was majority support for the invasion of Afghanistan early on. Of course, at the same time, there was a highly mobilized anti-war movement immediately. Um, you know, you mentioned in my bio that I was one of the co-founders of United for Peace and Justice. Actually, what happened was on Tuesday, September 11, 2001, uh, we, I was on the steering committee of the uh, protest against the IMF World Bank. Uh, that, and that was, there were okay, protest schedules for September 27th of 2001. And so we had a regular conference call uh, scheduled for that day, and we decided that we needed to turn this uh, so-called anti-globalization protest into an anti-war protest. And several weeks later, there were 25,000 people in the streets of Washington, D.C., marching against the invasion of Afghanistan with 150,000 people up by the fall in April. The point being, and, and polling showed, I think it was something like 37% opposition, which is actually very high, I think, considering the, the circumstances of when, which we're dealing in which only one member of, of the House even spoke up, right? So the point to, for me is, if there had been a process in which the people of the United States actually had to engage in debate and had a say, I am convinced that we would have won that vote, okay? I am convinced of that. Um, and the fact that we were able to turn public opinion in several, in several, several years despite everything that was against us, sort of speaks to that. Also, just in terms of my academic research, because everything I was saying there was sort of work I was doing in the course of um, organizing, right? Um, I studied constitutionalization, and, um, and the, specifically, uh, I studied the question of whether more constitutional change is a good thing or not. It's the same kind of question, right? Um, and what I've found uh, so far is that um, it's generally a good idea to engage in more amendments and more changes in your constitution if your goal is democracy, if you have a normative end of democracy. That deliberation, the, you know, the Dewey hypothesis that deliberation works is actually correct. Um, so but that's, that's my rebuttal. I would have a follow-on, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let David, David. Very briefly rebut the rebuttal. Uh, I, 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 love, I want to revive Bring the Guard Home. I'm all for that. But um, I don't think people, I, I think people would get it right much more often than Congress. I mean, you would have, if you had an annual vote, you would have had at most one year of war on Afghanistan, not 16. Right? I mean, there's no question. But, uh, it, I mean, uh, throwing darts at a phone book to create the legislature would be, would do far better than Congress, right? But uh, I, I think the people should not have the power to commit a crime any more than Congress should have the power to commit a crime. Congress shouldn't have the power to create slavery, shouldn't have the power to create war, which is banned by treaty that's supreme law of land under Article 6. Mm -hmm. Okay, I agree with that. Yeah. Okay, <coughs> yes sir. If, if we were to have a national referendum like that major campaign across the country, <coughs> picture the ads that the so-called defense contractors would be funding. Yeah. That was my rebuttal to his. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's what I was going to ask too. Mm -hmm. uh, when are you going to take that? Again, you know, the terms of debate are always against popular movements in terms of access to resources and so on. But we, when we have forums to engage our you know fellow citizens, right, we do better than when we don't. And so I, I agree with David's sort of rebuttal to my rebuttal that uh, the people would get it right more often. I actually also agree with him that we may not want to even engage in a campaign that recognizes the legitimacy of war. So I understand that point as well. But, you know, bring it on. Um, let's have more democracy, not less. And the problem of corporate domination of politics is one that, uh, you know, has been engaged with. I mean, if you look at uh, the move to amend campaigns in these ballot measures, yeah. Yeah. right, they're winning with, you know, 70 to 90 percent of the vote, uh, despite the fact that chambers of commerce have actively campaigned against that. Yeah, just, 
just that I, I just make an analogy. As my, my colleague at Yale, um, Jim Whitman, has shown in the, in the criminal context, the United States has by far among developed nations um, the most punitive uh, criminal justice system, not only in terms of the laws that it has, it's how many people it incarcerates, but the, the manner, the inhumane manner in which people are incarcerated. And at least he claims, and I think he makes an incredibly good argument, it's because unlike other countries where criminal justice is largely bureaucratically controlled, in the United States it is democratically controlled. Now, the, I, I know that the response would be, it's not really democracy. Right. Um, so the question is, given the fact that we live in this very imperfect democracy, do we want to introduce um, uh, more popular control when we know in the criminal context the people have made a, a, a made a hash of things. I just throw that out as an as a as a as an analogy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this, I really um, enjoyed all of your presentations. Uh, I, I think one of the questions implicit in this conversation is like, why are people so supportive of the war, right? And I think one of the answers to that is, like, well, it's nationalism and nativism and all of the other things that are associated with the success of Trump. Um, and, and I think then the question is, well, what is behind that? And one easy response is just to say, oh, well, you know, it's like some kind of psychological illness or something like that. But I also, like, another way to think about that is that it is a legal connection between that um, feeling and our institutions, and that comes from birthright citizenship and this idea that people are attached to their nation states like the nation the word nation is from the latin root nasi which means birth and there's a very small number of causes on whose behalf we see people risking their lives and killing not you know in small numbers but by the hundreds and the thousands and that that has to do with intergenerational attachments and religion and, and these aren't things that are just like inchoate, but they become institutionalized through, um, the, through citizenship and the birthright citizenship in particular, as opposed to an alternative, which could be um, people having their citizenship based on residence and having free movement. So for instance, you know, again, going back to the law, when we see New York and New Jersey disagree about who owns the Statue of Liberty or Ellis Island, they go to court, right? And you don't have, so that there, that there's only certain kinds of um, you know, differences that have to do with people experiencing their attachments based on birth. And again, that has to do with the law, like the laws that set up the geographies and the laws that um, bestow citizenship based on um, the rules of not you know, just birth, but um, uh, citizenship and also marriage, which um, develops the kinship structures that allow people to trace these ties. And I'll stop you know, the going on. The glory more I have a book called States Without Nations, <laughs> um, Citizenship for Mortals, um, that was published a few years ago um, by Columbia. And uh, there's a, I, 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 my name is Jackie Stevens. I direct the deportation research clinic at Northwestern University. And part of the reason I focus on um, deportation is to make these connections between the citizenship laws that we have and these you know, broader kinds of attachments that lead to war. Um, the, the other point I want to make is just like a follow-up on, on what um, some of you were talking about. And I think it's kind of interesting that when people in our armed forces swear allegiance, it's not to a people. It's to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm just kind of curious about it, like what, and I'm sure this was connected with your movement, but you know, have there been any mobilizations within, mobilizations within the armed forces to say, well, you know, the Constitution, um, doesn't allow us to go to war unless the Congress passes it. And you know, how how has that been responded? Like, what the response has been to that? Yeah, well, there have been refusals to obey illegal orders and to redeploy and to deploy for the first time and to continue in war and to uh, and Iraq veterans against the war has tried to uh, you know strategically advance uh, these concerns within the active. Uh, military, uh, where the leading cause of death is, of course, suicide. There is, of course, some uh, disgruntlement and lack of satisfaction with mission uh, when the leading cause of death is suicide. But I, I think if, if we're going to talk about applying democracy to war and treat war as, you know, an acceptable thing to do, 
I, I think if you were to ask people whether they wanted a war in Afghanistan or a war on ISIS following the most intense, skillful propaganda ever, if they were saying a war for we the people, and I might be fighting in it, yeah. we'd be safe. Right? I mean, Gallup did a poll in 2014 and asked people in numerous countries, would you ever fight in a war for your country? And I was just thrilled to see so many countries that it was like 10%, 20%. You know, the United States was 44% would fight in a war for their country. 43% of them were lying. <laughs> the stations are open. What's preventing them fighting in a war for their country, right? Nothing. But they want to think of themselves. But if it came to reality, they would not vote for a war that they were going to fight. Yeah. And, we don't have the draft. and just, um, you know, there, there, I, I don't know the whole history of this, but I know that there have been a number of um, uh, challenges brought on behalf of members of the U.S. Armed Forces on the basis of um, not only sort of uh, you know, critical moral claims, right, mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, rejection of the authorization of the military force uh, 2001 in particular, you know, the unending war resolution and so on. And those have, um, as far as I know, in, all failed um, in court because of something that's called the political question doctrine, in which the federal judiciary has uh, allowed themselves to become um, essentially an adjunct of whatever the heck uh, the executive branch wants to do in terms of war making. Um, they say that questions of war and peace are political questions, not for the federal judiciary to intervene. And, um, and therefore, um, they don't rule on the uh, constitutionality of, uh, of some of these war power questions, right? Um, and so, you know, in building the Bring the Guard Home campaign, uh, it was a coalition effort that Liberty Tree facilitated, but we not only brought in groups like Peace Action, but very consciously, Veterans for Peace, military families speak out, Iraq veterans against the war, and so on, and in, in veterans and military families, and in some cases, active duty military uh, and members of the military were um, very important uh, sort of leaders in that effort because we wanted it to go somewhere, right? Not it wasn't simply about this legal strategy and this legislative strategy, but it's also a social movement building strategy. The legal strategy involved is important to recognize. Essentially, Benson Scotch's brilliance in this was to make the political question doctrine a problem for uh, the war machine by forcing, by, by enacting statutes that force the governor to review the authorizations for the use of military force and to decide whether or not it was a lawful authorization. If a governor were to decide that it was not a lawful authorization, it's still a political question. Federal government goes after the state, and what do the courts do, right? So I, you know, that that happened a, here with Rudy Perpich in the Panama. And the right. Kings. This is a building off of Perpich. It was a response to Perpich. Exactly. Okay. Um, I saw the gentleman in the back and then um, this gentleman sure. here. And I don't know if we're going to have much time for more questions. But if we do, then it's this lady here. Okay. Um, uh, I'm from Hawaii. And uh, Aaron Watata, Lieutenant Aaron Watata. Please, no conversation. Said that said the same thing as uh, Kofi Annan, the head of the United Nations, said, was that the Iraq war was an illegal war, and he would not, and Watata had been deployed and served in Afghanistan, and I think he was willing to go back to Afghanistan, but he would not go to Iraq because, uh, because it was illegal, according to the, uh, the United Nations uh, declare the Nuremberg trial. I don't believe he ever went to Afghanistan. He said he would not uh, go to Iraq, but he would go to Afghanistan, and he had been ordered to Iraq, and that's what he refused. Oh, I thought he had served in Iraq. I, I don't think so. I was there. I saw him interviewed. Okay. I met him. Yeah, I, okay. I really think that's correct. Okay, but anyway, he, 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 he refused to go, but he said he would go to Afghanistan. Right. Yeah, and he was discerning between the two wars. He, yeah. he said it was an illegal war, as mm -hmm. Copiano had said. Right, okay. right. Um, this gentleman here. But the thing ahead. is, though, is anybody got anything to say about that? Do you have anything to say about that, gentleman? Was it an illegal war? 
Yeah. All wars are illegal wars. <laughs> I, I will, I, I'll, I'll demur on this. Uh, Afghanistan was legal. It had Security Council authorization. It had a self-defense under Article 51. The Security Iraq. Council did not authorize the war in Afghanistan. I'm sorry? The Security Council did not authorize war in Afghanistan. Yes, yes they did in 2001. No. I'm pretty sure they did. Everybody's pretty sure they did, but... When did you guys do that? that? <laughs> 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 Here's the interesting question, right? Because when people answer this question, and we, we had a conference on, um, at Georgetown Law School, I'm remembering, uh, who decides about war, and, and it was the same uh, kind of dynamic where um, the, the resort was to international law, right? And I'll point out that, um, that what we haven't talked about is whether it was lawful under the Constitution of the United States, right? Yeah. Which will be another, which will be a, the next question, okay. right? Mm -hmm. But but that question usually doesn't even come up anymore. Well, they had the yeah. magical AUMF, which actually did right. apply for that. I mean, uh, they, Afghanistan, I think, on all fours was was legal. Right. Um, uh, now you may want to change international law, but uh, everyone, I, 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 th that seems. Um, as clear a case as a legal war as you get. Um, if you I, accept that an AUMF is a, is a lawful substitute for declaration of war, so when I referred to the War Powers Resolution, most of the anti-war movement, which is what I came up with, had always rejected the War Powers Act as, as an appropriate substitute for war, for war declaration, so, right. which, which I agree with. You know, right. I, I think Congress, after declared war, they didn't, AUMFs are not a lawful substitute, right. but that's another question. Right, that's it. As a, uh, Iraq, I think, was on all fours sure. illegal. Yeah. I think we agree on that. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir? Hi, I'm, uh, should I turn around? Yeah. yeah. I'm Terry from uh, Cape Town, and David, you talk about the unknown cannot agree on pact, but also unknown, and I think of interest, is that when Cecil, or Cecil is known here, Cecil John Rose died in Cape Town in 1902, he of diamond and gold notoriety, he left all his worldly goods to fund the, the creation of a movement to entice the United States back into the British Empire so that together the English and Americans would be a military power so strong it could not be challenged, and of course, in the cause of world peace. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very virtuous. And of course, the, the Council on Foreign Relations, Chatham House in London, um, the Rhodes Scholarships are disproportionately allocated to Americans to anglicize them to the virtues of British colonialism at Oxford U University. Mm -hmm. And right after the Americans got involved in, in the Philippines after 1898, uh, Rudyard Kipling, who was uh, um, yeah. one of uh, uh, Rhodes's proteges, of course, wrote The White Man's Burden calling upon the United States to take up its international and imperialist responsibilities. Um, so that movement then was geared to creating this union and to, to entice the, the, of course, Rhodes assumed that the English would be the senior partners, um, mm -hmm. and we'll come on to that, but uh, even in the Second World War, uh, Vice President Wallace was anticipated yeah. to succeed FDR, but at the 1944 um, Democratic Convention, uh, suddenly Truman was launched forth with huge propaganda efforts from the British government who were terrified about a U.S. Um, campaign to, to destroy the British Empire. And so Truman becomes president when FDR dies, and then the first thing he wants to do is to drop a bomb on, on, on Japan and threaten the Soviet Union, and then we have Churchill talking about the, uh, the, the, the Iron Curtain. Uh, roll on... Um, of course, 2003, and of course, who invents the weapons of mass destruction but dear old Tony Blair? Um, of um, but we now, there's more and more evidence um, released by uh, Snowden and others of the Five Eyes Alliance. And who comprises the Five Eyes Alliance? The US, Canada, Australia, England, and New Zealand how the English-speaking white countries of the world have arrogated to themselves the right to intervene in Afghanistan or Iraq or whatever, 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 and that really needs to be exposed. Mm -hmm. And it's compounded by the agreement negotiated between Margaret Thatcher and um, Prince Banda of Saudi Arabia in 1985 with the encouragement of, of uh, President Re uh, Reagan uh, of a 43 billion pound arms deal between Britain and Saudi Arabia um, 
funded, of course, by, by oil, but Saudi Arabia consigns oil to the Bank of England, which then distributes it to Shell and to BP. And over the years, and it's covered by the British Secrets, um, Secrets Act, so you can't investigate it in England, <laughs> but over the years, this fund has developed, it's an estimated to be worth about 150 billion US dollars. Now, its purpose is threefold. A, to guarantee British and American support for the Saudi royal family against domestic insurrection. Mm -hmm. Two, to insist that oil is marketed in US dollars in order to create uh, the power of the US dollar and mm -hmm. unlimited military expenditure. And so if people like Saddam Hussein or uh, um, Muammar Gaddafi or Hugo Chavez start wanting, uh, they want payment in euros or gold or whatever, the next thing we have is regime change. Mm -hmm. But the third point of this, this uh, agreement is to fund covert destabilization of resource-rich countries in Asia and Africa. So Afghanistan, Nigeria with Boko Haram, etc., etc. Of course, under the, the, the guise of uh, combating the, the, war, the, um, the war on terror. Uh, but it cannot be investigated in the UK because of, because of the Official Secrets Act, and I think it's time the Americans started exposing it. Okay, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> My response to the kellogg Briand Pact, it's a great idea, I think, a referendum for people to vote for an aggressive <coughs> war. Of course people will vote for the right to push a button to send a drone around the world, not to carry a gun and risk getting yeah. shot. No, that won't happen. And that's not where the laws are going. I think what we need is to give the right of referendum to people to hold the leaders to aggressive war is illegal period and if leaders civilian or military initiate an uh, aggressive war then the people have a right with no statute of limitations to subject those leaders to the highest penalty available in the land I would prefer it not include a death penalty but if that's still on the books they get that for having initiated an illegal war. And then when we come to our senses, they're going to pay a big personal price and maybe they will scratch their heads and ponder if their rewards for the military industry are worth it. Okay, Jenny? That's a good idea. Interesting. I think the one avenue we haven't tried is, is consumer law. The in, newspaper in Madison called The Onion had a report that the <laughs> U.S. flag has been recalled, having resulted in some several hundred thousand deaths <laughs> unnecessary. And so, I want to pray. <laughs> I, think a, I, I, I mean, the, the, the crime of aggression is it's, it's a really interesting issue. Um, what you raised was a slightly different um, um, set up than it's normally. The, norm, the normal thing is you have the International Criminal Court, which the United States is not a party, um, and um, uh, they have not implemented yet the crime of aggression. Nobody can be prosecuted yet for the crime of aggression. Um, uh, but um, I'm ambivalent about the ICC um, prosecuting for the crime of aggression, precisely because, like with all other war crimes, aggression and war crimes only happen in Africa. Um, um, and that's, that's a big problem. If you have the Security Council um, veto, then it will never apply to, um, to the P5. Um, that having been said, um, I am in favor of domestic um, uh, prosecution. Um, as many of you might know, just last week, uh, the British courts rejected Tony Blair's um, um, uh, possible prosecution on the claim that that, uh, that aggression is not a crime under, uh, under British domestic law. I think that's um, I think that's very debatable, um, but um, that would get rid of the problem of there's only war crimes in Africa. Exactly. Um, and so I think I would be quite supportive of that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, last person, Steve. Okay. My question is for Scott. Uh, <clears throat> Veterans for Peace uh, statement of purpose has that it renounces war as an instrument of national policy, just as the Kellogg Green Pact states, and also it says that uh, all parties shall settle their disputes by Pacific means only, including Afghanistan, I may add. 
But are you willing to take, since you've written this wonderful book, to take the Kellogg Reimpact with you, as David has done, and display it in the most prominent place that you can think of, yeah. from Veterans for Peace? Yeah. Um, for I mean... A gift? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yale University, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that, yeah, that's, um, this is, uh, I, I, I will have, first of all, um, you know, extremely proud of the path. Um, you know, I, I spent six years of my life writing, writing about it, um, claimed it remade the world. Um, so um, uh, I, would, uh, I would be honored um, to have this in the most prominent place I know, though, I don't think I know a prominent place um, is, my only, is my only problem. But, but you know, I, I will be speaking about the book around uh, if, if this is... That's a prominent place. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, if, um, if, if, this were, if there were some facsimile of this, I would love to. Where is this from? That's, that's, that's the original oh, one. Oh, well, 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 thank you. I, I, it's the only one. Oh, it's a great... Okay, wait, wait, I, great honor, and yes, I will. Proudly. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>